Welcome to everyone, you know. Uh, so the second talk of this uh, afternoon will be given by Dr. Daniel Wa. He's currently working at the um, Tennis University in Berlin. Um, and uh, his uh, title is uh, Insights into Learner Impact Basins from GRAIL Observations. It's very, very interesting because as we have heard uh, from the first talk this, uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, the, um, at the end, you know, all the learner crater chronology uh, back in time had to come from those uh, big uh, craters uh, basins, and then and then we have the from Grail we have the first hand information. Uh, Daniel, please uh, start uh, your your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ip, and many thanks also also for inviting me to the seminar. So today I want to give a talk about the impact basins on the moon and what we can learn. Uh, by looking at their gravitational field signal. So uh, the lunar gravity field was observed in a super high resolution by the GRAIL mission. And uh, Mark Vitrek already gave a talk in the first session of the seminar. So for further details about the GRAIL mission, I would like to refer to the talk given by Mark, which I think is still available online. So for my title page, I chose this quite prominent image here of Orientale Basin. Um, and Orientale is one of the largest and youngest basins on the moon. And this image here shows a digital terrain model of the surface relief. And overlain in color, we can see the gravity anomalies. And um, I chose this picture because here we can already see um, very nicely the relation between the surface morphology and the gravity field signal um, in, this, in this image here. So um, we can see positive gravity anomalies in the center of the basin, given in red, surrounded by gravity low, bounded here by this topographic ring, and farther out, the gravity field back, turns back to normal. A typical signature many basins are showing. So impact cratering is one of the most important processes happening in our solar system. And this picture here is showing the surface of the lunar highlands. Um, and we can see clearly why the moon is the perfect candidate to observe and study impact craters. Millions of craters can be found um, on the surface with various dimensions and various forms. And uh, since there's no erosion caused by an atmosphere, and no plate tectonic activities like on Earth, even very, very old structures are still preserved and can be studied until today. The largest craters are called impact basins, and they are at the same time also the oldest impact structures, which can be found on the lunar surface. And this is also what makes impact basins so interesting. So by studying impact basins, their dimension, their shape, and their formation time, we can learn more about the impact of flux in the early solar system. And we can also learn more about the impactors forming them and about the target rock. So my talk is structured as follows. Uh, first of all, I want to give some information about the morphology of impact basins and what kind of different basins exist. Um, thanks to the GRAIL mission, we have very accurate and high-resolution gravity data of the Moon. So we were able to study the gravity signature of basins in much more detail than before. And we will see that the geophysical characteristics are very special for lunar basins compared to smaller craters. It's getting even more exciting when we combine gravity data with farther data. So analyzing um, the gravitational field, for example, together with the topography, we can not only take a look at the mass distribution below the surface, but it's also possible to solve for the porosity structure of lunar impact basins, which will be presented in the second part of my presentation. So basins, as I already said, formed very early in the history of the moon between 3.9 and 4.2 billion years when the moon was still very hot. So the lithosphere had just solidified so that basins could form and remain. Um, basins have um, dimensions starting at a diameter of about 
200 kilometers and the largest known impact basin on the moon and at the same time the largest in our solar system is South Pole Aitken Basin with a diameter of about 2,400 kilometers. But uh, here on this slide I'm not showing um, South Pole Aitken, this one is Schrödinger Basin and um, this beautiful um, picture was taken by the camera on board of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And here we can already clearly see important features of impact basins. Impact basins have a very flat crater floor. It's a bit comparable with the crater floor of complex craters. Then they have huge terrace-shaped crater walls, like visible here in the in the lower part of this image. And for Schrödinger, the height difference between the crater floor and the upper edge of the outer rim is about six kilometers. So these are very, very high crater walls. And um, impacts or impact basins often show these ring structures inside, as also seen here for Schrödinger. If a basin only shows one inner ring, they are called peak ring basins like Schrödinger or here in the center Korolev. And if they show several rings, they are called multi-ring basins. But there are also some basins not showing any ring structures at all. So um, the reason may be found in the formation process, but also caused by the relaxation of the basin and the modification uh, through subsequent impacts. Another very important feature is that basins reveal a huge positive mass anomaly in the center, which can be seen looking at the gravitational field signal. So the positive mass anomalies in the centers are called maskins, and they are given here in, in the red color. And maskins were already detected uh, quite early in 1968 by Müller and Sjorgen, but um, while earlier maskins were only related to the Mare Basaltic rock, GRAIL data revealed that maskins correlate with the location of lunar basins. So from the gravitational field, we can learn more about the mass distribution of a planetary body. And um, in planetary science, usually um, a gravity field is measured by putting a spacecraft into orbit and tracking its acceleration from Earth via Doppler shift measurements. But since the moon is in a synchronous orbit, always facing the same hemisphere towards Earth, the far side keeps hidden and the acceleration of the satellites is not easy, easily being tracked on the far side. So other concepts were needed. And um, so the mission design of GRAIL was similar to the GRACE mission where two orbiting um, satellites were put into lunar orbit. And by measuring changes in distance between the two satellites, the gravity field below them could be obtained. Um, different to GRACE, where monthly changes in Earth's gravity field are derived, GRAIL was dedicated to observe the Moon's static gravity field. And um, this figure here shows the Bogier gravity field of the Moon with the near side on the left and the far side on the right. And Bogie gravity is a special kind of gravity field where the gravitational attraction coming from the surface topography is removed. And in this way, the inner mass distribution below the surface becomes visible. Um, practically, the Bogie gravity is realized by first estimating the gravitational attraction um, of the topography using only topographic data and applying a certain density for the topographic masses. And in the second step, this so-called Bogier correction is subtracted from the total gravity field signal so that the crossed mental boundary and deeper structures become visible. Thanks to the high resolution of the obtained um, data from Gray mission, impact structures could be studied in much more detail than before this mission. This figure here from Newman et al. 2015 shows the Bogier gravity of the Freundlich Sharonov basin. Um, the red color marks regions of um, positive Bogier anomalies and green negative anomalies. The topographic rings are given two. Here we can see the outer rim, and this dashed line here shows the peak ring. 
Um, Newman et al. 2015 found that the positive mass anomaly in the center is located um, inside the pea green. And it's surrounded by gravity low, bounded by the rim crest, and farther outside the gravity uh, turns back to normal. So um, this form of a bullseye pattern is true for many basins which can be found on the, on the moon. And um, since basins are the oldest um, impact structures which can be found on the moon, they are often highly degraded and sometimes very hard to recognize in the topography. But with the knowledge about the gravity signature of lunar basins, also basins have been detected where any hints could be found in the surface topography, but in the gravitational field signal. So Newman et al. 2015 set up a new basin inventory with about 60 candidates, and some of them only suggested using gravity data. Um, due to the relation between the gravity field signal and the topography, the gravity field may also be used um, to determine the dimension of a basin. The outer rim has twice the radius of the peak ring in the center, so even if no ring structures are visible in the topography, the gravity field can be used to determine the basin dimension. But why do impact basins exhibit this positive mass anomaly in the center? So one would expect maybe a reduced gravity, but not an enhanced one. So and in this figure here, um, the topography and the Bouguer gravity of impact basins on the right hand side compared to smaller complex, complex craters on the left are sketched. So for complex craters, um, a reduced gravity is observed and um, the replacement of material during the impact should not influence the boogie gravity since the ma surface masses um, have, already, have already been removed. But the crustal rock below the crater may highly be fractured due to the shock wave, uh, which, um, which is triggered during the impact, passing the material. And also for basins, a fracture of rock is expected, even a stronger one because the impact was larger. But here we can observe an opposite picture as seen also in the slide before. Melosh et al. 2013 showed that the reason for this positive mass anomaly in the center is most likely caused by a mental uplift and a thinning of the crust due to an isostatic adjustment after the impact. So we have seen that the mental uplift only occurs for lunar basins and smaller craters do not show this behavior. And um, yeah, in different studies, sometimes different definitions are used for the minimum diameter of a lunar basin. Sometimes one can find 200 kilometers and sometimes 300 kilometers. And I think a good measure for defining the minimum diameter of a basin is to use the gravity field data. Um, Soda Bloom et al. 2015 investigated craters formed in the lunar highlands and they measured the mass anomaly in the center um, considering the Bouguer anomalies. And by comparing the central Bouguer anomaly, given here on the vertical, um, with the crater diameter, they found that there's a break in slope at a diameter of 280 kilometers, indicating here the mental uplift. So if we define a basin having um, a positive central Bouguer anomaly in the center caused by a mental uplift, the minimum dimension should be set to a diameter of 280 kilometers or 200 kilometers rounded. But considering the positive Bouguer anomaly in the center of lunar basins, we also have um, to take care not interpreting them wrong. So many basins um, exhibit mare basalt in their centers, and these mare basalts are of much higher density compared to the anorthositic rock of the lunar highlands, or where the lunar highlands are composed of. So if a wrong density is used calculating the Bouguer anomalies, a wrong picture may arise. The figure here shows the Bouguer gravity of the Moscoviense basin located in the lunar highlands, 
And um, the Mare basalt in the center is denoted here by this outer line, by this black line. And the map on the left side was calculated using a constant density of 2,550 kilograms per cubic meter, which is the mean density of the upper Highland crust. But the Mare basaltic regions are expected to have a much higher density. So applying um, 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 adequate density of about 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter for the Mare basaltic infill of the basin when calculating the Bouguer anomalies, we get a completely different result. While on the left side, where a constant crustal density was used, differences of up to 900 milligrams a cure, applying appropriate densities for the Mare basaltic regions, the peak is still visible but it's much less pronounced so that only differences of about 300 milligrams a cure. So we can see it's of, of major significance to apply the correct density for the surface masses when calculating the boogie correction. So we have seen how the gravity field of lunar basins look like, but it's getting really exciting when we combine gravity data with other data. So one example we have already seen, um, the Bouguer gravity, where the topography together with den density is used to estimate the attraction from the terrain. And um, another thing is that since the short wavelengths gravity field is highly correlated with the topography, we can also solve for the bulk density of the crustal material. Here below, I'm also giving some literature for some details on the topics. Um, gravity data can also be used to, to determine the thickness of the crust. Um, but Bouguer anomalies um, depict the surface um, of, uh, as Bouguer anomalies depict the surface of the crust mantle boundary, the so-called Moho, but the problem is that the gravity data is ambitious meaning that a mass anomaly may be assigned um, to a certain location, but not to a certain depth. And for determining the thickness of the crust, we need um, an average crustal thickness to constrain the moho to a certain depth. And here the seismic recordings performed by the Apollo program are very important since um, they can serve um, as constraints for the thickness of the crust at particular locations. Having in addition, uh, in addition the gravitational field, um, having in addition to the gravity field also um, information about the density of the grains of a rock, uh, we can solve for the porosity of, of the uh, crustal material. Hung and Vitorek found that there's a relation between the grain density of lunar rocks and their titanium and iron content. And um, using spectrum metadata from the Lunar Prospector mission, they determined global grain densities which are needed to solve for the porosity of rock. As a reminder, porosity is the measure of empty spaces in a material which may be derived from the relation between the bulk density and the grain density, while bulk density is the mass per volume including all empty spaces and grain density denotes the mass of a material excluding the empty voids. So in the following I want to show uh, the latest findings about the porosity structure of lunar basins but before we go into detail I want to show this global map here of the porosity variations of the upper lunar crust because here we can already identify striking features of lunar impact basins. This is a Molweide projected map centered at the lunar far side. So uh, this is the lunar highlands here in the center. And the black outlines denote uh, Mare regions, which have not been part of the study, which therefore are kept white. Um, the black circles um, denote the outer rims of all suggested um, impact basins by Newman et al. 2015. And the color bar is given here on the left and we can see that the high porosities are denoted in green 
and regions of very dense material, so of low porosity, are given in dark blue. Considering the global map, we can see that first of all, the upper crust uh, shows very large variations in porosity, ranging from about 3% to more than 20%. And we can see that the variations of the porosity co coincide with the locations of the lunar impact basins. So around the largest and youngest craters, for example, Orientale or Moscoviense, um, we can observe very high porosities around them. And inside the basins, for example, for Herzsprung or Korolev, we can observe very low porosities. So let's take a closer look at single basins. So here I'm showing Korolev and Galois Basin located on the lunar far side. On the left, we can see a Mercato projected map of the crustal porosity with shaded topography in the background. In the center, we can see the Korolev Basin and in the southeast, it's a smaller Galois Basin. And the color bar is about the same as in the figure before. Um, the solid line marks the outer rims of the of the basins and the dashed line, the peak rings. On the right-hand side, I am showing azimuthily averaged radial porosity profiles, calculated, creating many profiles running from the center of the basin to the outside and calculating their mean afterwards. Um, for some basins, also for these two candidates here, only a certain segment around the basins was used creating the porosity profiles to avoid that these adjacent basins influence their porosity signal. Um, the lower horizontal axis in these plots shows the distance to the crater center normalized to the crater size. And on the top, we can see the absolute distances and the vertical um, axis shows the crystal porosity given in percent. We can also identify lines within the plot. So the vertical lines show the outer and the inner rings and the horizontal line um, shows the average background porosity, which was estimated between two and three crater radii away from the center. Um, for Kobolev, the densest material can be found in the center within the peak ring with a porosity of only 5%. And um, so we have to know when an impactor hits the surface of a planet or a moon, a strong shock wave is released. And this shock wave has enough pressure to melt the rock at the point of the impact. And also a lot of material is ballistically excavated forming the crater then. And these low porosities, which can be found exactly at the point where the melt pool is expected after impact, um, yeah, can be described by, by this melt pool because when the melt pool crystallizes, it creates a very, very dense rock without many winds. And um, this is why the porosities in the center are very low. Farther outside, the poros porosities um, increase having a maximum at about 15% at about 1.5 crater radii away from the center. Um, the high porosities at this location may be explained by two factors. First of all, outside the crater, the shock wave um, does not have enough pressure to melt the rock, but it still has enough pressure to fracture the rock, leading to higher porosities. And the secondly, um, during the impact, a lot of material was ballistically removed, forming a thick ejector blanket around the crater. And this ejector blanket is expected to have a very loose structure, leading to high porosities around the crater. Um, these effects have been suggested by numerical modeling, simulating impact cratering. And now for the first time, these effects could also be confirmed by observations. 
Galois, which is located here next to Korolev, um, was formed subsequently. So the initial porosity of the target rock was already high when the impact happened. And while Korolev um, shows a very pronounced signature, Galois Basin shows a similar pattern with the low porosity in the center, marked with an A, and um, high porosities farther outside, marked with a B, but it has a muted signature. Searching for the reason for this different pronunciation and porosity signature, we looked at the porosity signature of highland basins with respect to their dimension. Here on the left-hand side, I'm showing the minimum porosities, which could be found in the center of all investigated basins. And the basin diameter is given here on the horizontal axis in a logarithmic scale. And uh, here on the vertical, we can see the porosity given in percent. Um, basins, which minimum could not be determined because there was a basaltic infill in the center and um, due to this data lag, um, these, these minima could not be um, estimated. And these points are given in blue and were not used for estimating here this adjusted trend line. Considering the overall trend, we can see that larger basins show a slightly lower minimum porosity in their center compared to smaller craters. The lower porosity for larger basins may be explained by a larger melt pool for the larger basins. And um, looking here at the right hand side, um, I'm showing the maximum porosities found at about one crater radius away from the crater center. And here in this plot, a clear trend can be seen showing that larger basins possess much higher maximum porosities exterior to their main rim than smaller candidates. The higher porosities most, are most probably caused by a thicker ejector blanket of porous characteristics, since for larger basins, more material was replaced. So overall, we can say that larger basins show a more pronounced signature than smaller candidates. But apart from the basins with a pronounced or less pronounced porosity pattern, we found also basins not showing any distinct signature at all. Here, I am showing the example of Kela West Basin. And its porosity is about the same over the entire extent and beyond having about the same value as the background pattern of about 12%. So there seem to be further effects influencing the porosity signature of lunar basins. Besides the porosity signature regarding basin size, we also consider the relation between the porosity signature and the time of basin formation. On the left, I'm showing again the minimum porosity located at the basin center. And at the right, again, the maximum porosity at about one crater radius away from the center, but this time as a function of the formation sequence. Small numbers denote um, early formation times and the large numbers um, denote younger basins. Um, we considered um, different sequence catalogs and um, most of, most of them do not differ uh, too much. So we decided to use the most recent one published by Orgel et al. 2018. Um, but unfortunately, the considered catalogs concentrate on basins with diameters larger 300 kilometers and basins discovered by Newman et al. 2015 based on gray gravity data um, were not included. So therefore, we see here a reduced number of points compared to the previous plot. But even if the statistic is limited, we can see that younger basins um, exhibit a much lower minimum porosity in the center compared to the older ones. And we can also see that they um, exhibit higher maximum porosities exterior to the main rim. So younger basins um, show a more pronounced porosity signature with low porosities in the center higher porosities exterior to the main rim compared 
to their older candidates. And this behavior may be explained by the fact that older basins have longer been exposed to subsequent impacts. And these later impacts of different strengths smeared out the initial porosity signature, leading to a final average porosity, which is about the same as the global average porosity of about 13%. So this brings me now to an end of my talk, where I want to give a short summary. So lunar impact basins reveal a wide variety in surface morphology and interior structure compared to simple or complex craters. Combining gravity field data with other observations, like the topography or grain densities, further insights about the geophysical characteristics of basins could be gained, like, for example, the constraints on layered structures, the bike density, and the porosity of crustal material. A distinct pattern in porosity for most lunar basins was found, with low porosities in the center and high porosities at the main rim and exterior. And we suggest that all basins show this distinct signature after formation. And we could see that um, impacts modify the porosity of the upper lunar crust significantly. And um, with this, I want to end my talk and want to say thank you for your attention. Hey, Daniel, thank you. Uh, this is a quick talk. Um, I was expecting, you know, you, you would say far more than <laughs> you have. <to> <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have more to say. Uh, yeah, so may I have... sorry, it was only half an hour now. Or... Yeah, it was a little bit short. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, but that's fine. Uh, the, uh, anyone in the audience want to ask uh, Daniel questions um, or two questions? Uh, please unmute yourself if you want to. Now I have, I have, because you, you, you seem that you are saying that um, one of the, uh, the application of this um, of the Gale uh, measurement is to to determine the density and hence the porosity of the crust. Mm -hmm. And then you also describe in detail the, the spatial distribution, the profile of the porosity distribution from the center of the crater to, to the limb and beyond. Uh, but then can you say, you know, uh, what is the origin of this porosity? I mean, it must be a very easy question. But uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so um, we have seen that the porosity varies a lot for the, for the, for the upper crust of the moon. And um, at the beginning, so when we considered only the uh, lunar rocks, a much higher, um, a much lower porosity and a much higher density was expected because we knew that it's um, unorthor unorthocytic rock. And uh, we have the samples here in the laboratories. And um, yeah, looking at these samples, um, a much higher um, density and a much lower porosity was expected. Um, than Grail mission revealed. And the reason for this, this um, higher porosities around the basins and the lower porosities into the basins are for sure um, caused by the impacts. And I think it doesn't matter so much um, how, how large uh, the impact is. So um, also the smaller impacts already uh, modify the um, the porosity of the upper lunar crust significantly. And um, of course, the larger um, craters and the larger impacts um, creating the basins um, had a much higher influence on the crustal porosity of the upper lunar crust. But uh, when we considered the, um, the porosity structures um, regarding the different ages of the, of the basins, we have seen that really for the old basins, um, the subsequent impact smeared out the initial porosity signature. Well, you, you know, you, if you look at, you're talking about the, the, the porosity of the lunar rock, you usually mm -hmm. call it the micro porosity. And here with the crater, you're talking about macro porosity, right? So. Yeah, it's really about the, about the vents in the, in the rock. So the relation mm -hmm between the bike but, density. But then the, the, you talk about the highland, you know, only the, mm -hmm. the, on the, the I mean, the Maria uh, on the on the near side. Um, I mean, you must also measure the porosity there. 
Yeah, that's true. So um, I think your question was, we only considered um, the highlands and we left out the Maro Basaltic regions, right? Mm. So um, this has two, um, there are two reasons for this. First of all, the Mare Basaltic regions are very complex in their structure. So we have the Mare Basalt on top, but below the Mare Basalt, there's again this unorthocytic rock. So um, at the beginning, there was maybe only the unorthocyte, but then it was filled with the Mare Basaltic uh, infill. So it's very complicated when we take a look at the upper lunar crust and have these mixed, mixed sort of um, rocks there. But uh, there's also a technical issue, I have to admit, and um, because the, um, we, we determine the by, first of all, we um, use gravity data and the topography data. And um, by doing um, a correlation analysis between the um, topography and the um, gravitational field, but only using the spherical harmonics of high degree and order, one can solve for the bike density. But this is only working when we have some um, features in the topography. So we need a rough surface structure that this method is working. And the, the Mare basaltic areas are just too flat to get mm. reasonable results in, this, in these areas. Mm. Okay, I see. Mm. Uh, any other questions you know, uh, to follow up? Uh, this discussion and uh, well I you know um, Mark uh, he gave a talk and I mentioned that his talk to my students and one of them asked the question which I think you, you, I, I, I told her that I could not answer the question but I will ask you which oh, is oh, <laughs> <laughs> what what is what is the the spatial resolution uh, of, of, of the Gale uh, yeah Ah, this is a good question. It's varying a lot because um, the spatial resolution when we obtain a gravitational field using satellites is highly um, related to the altitude of the satellites. And I think in the primary mission, the, um, the altitude was about 50 kilometers above the surface, but the, in the extended mission, um, the Altitudes was lowered down for special um, regions of interest, for example, the Orientale Basin. And I think there we um, have altitudes of just a few kilometers, of five or six kilometers. So for these regions of, of special interest, where the altitude of the satellite was lowered down, we have a gravity field of much higher resolution compared to other regions in the, on the moon. And um, Another thing is um, that um, gravity data is um, given always in the spherical harmonic coefficients. And when we um, take a look at the planetary um, uh, and at the PDS, where we can download the data, we can, I think, nowadays find um, gravity field data derived to a spherical harmonic degree and order of 1,500. And there's a rule of thumb. Uh, where we can use the um, spherical harmonic coefficients to determine the spatial resolution. And I think um, yeah, you have to include the radius of the moon. And I think um, 1,500 spherical harmonic degree and order 1,500 corresponds to a spatial resolution of about four kilometers. But this is only true for the regions where um, the satellites flew this very, very low altitude, but they put all the data of high resolution and of lower resolution into one gravity model, which is why the spherical harmonics are, are so high. So I think uh, if, if one is really interested in, in um, looking at regions with, with this super high resolution, we have to figure out um, where this low altitude was flown, and then um, I would only suggest to take a look at these regions. And, and uh, from your point of view, there's no need to have to fly another uh, gravity uh, satellite to, to the moon, right? Yeah, for the moon, I have to say, I think we have a better gravity field than from Earth, maybe not in the temporal resolution, but in the spatial resolution. Um, but of course, it would also be interesting to see if there are temporal changes. Everyone expects that the moon has a static gravity field. 
but it would be also interesting to take a look if there are variations in the gravitational field like on Earth, because on Earth we can use the gravitational field data to, for example, observe um, changing water, water mass storages or, or other things. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is not true for, for the Moon, but we can still take a look at, at deeper structures if there are maybe movements, but who knows. <laughs> so if you if you you have the chance to to fly another gravity uh, mission, where would you go? I would go to Mars. I think Mars. that would be a nice uh, next object because there's so much interest now in Mars. We have mm -hmm. seismometers now on the on the um, on the Martian surface, mm -hmm. and as I already said, it's very nice to combine gravity data with uh, farther data. So I think Mars would be a nice object because here there's so much effort done now on the on the Martian surface that it would be very interesting to combine, uh, for example, the uh, seismic data from inside with the with the gravity data from from uh, another gray mission on Mars. <laughs> would that be a single spacecraft mission or, or, or dual spacecraft mission? And um, when you, um, yeah, for Mars, it would also be possible to put only one spacecraft into orbit because we, we don't have this problem of a locked orbit like for the moon. But of course, when we, when we put two spacecraft into orbits and also have a sophisticated orb orbit, which is maybe not completely polar, but a little bit shifted, then um, I would, so the, the gravity field coefficients of higher degree and order would be uh, much more improved with this technique. So having only um, maybe one satellite in orbit and um, measuring the gravitational field or obtaining the gravitational field uh, via Doppler shift measurements, this would maybe be a very good uh, solution for the lower degree coefficients. Mm -hmm. Do you think you can convince ESA to do such a mission? Well, let's see. They, they always say they are out of money. <laughs> 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 <Maybe true. laughs> okay, great. Um, any guy, any people have great ideas uh, to tell uh, to tell Daniel to, to, to ask Isa? <laughs> yeah, maybe I can't convince them not to to do another gravity mission on on the Mars. I think that uh, <laughs> maybe you could sort of begin up with the, the French. You know, they have this seismometer on the ground. They will be happy to, <laughs> to join you. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, Daniel, I think that is uh, still a bit too early, but uh, it's 20 minutes to, um, to four here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah but then the I think that uh, your talk is pretty precise. And, uh, and as you said, you know, you, you still have a second part not, 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 not being, you know, not being presented. I would, I would ask you again, you know, right? Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>